Hey guys, welcome back to the Detour Live, and geez, are we excited? <laughs> We've only got three days to go of this year's Giro, and it's going to be an epic battle, uh, particularly amongst the GC guys. And, and after Yates' ride, oh, it's game on. Uh, I'm your host, Dan Jones, joined as always, Olympic gold medalist. Scotty McGrory, and we've got another Olympic gold medalist, Bradley McGee, the one and only Aussie cycling legend. And Brad, uh, you look like something off Australia's most wanted, mate. We've got you, we've got you, we've got you live in the car. You've just outrun the yeah. cops, and you've got an extra fifteen minutes before the sirens start. Well, yeah, you're not far from the truth there, Dan. But just for the record, I'm not driving. I've pulled over. It's the end of the long work week. I'm on the M4 in Sydney's West. It's uh, it's glamorous. It's all glamour here, I tell you. Hey, uh, yeah. Brad, we're, we're, we we had plans to talk to you in the office, and obviously you're not in the office now. Is there any kind of story <laughs> as to why you're not in the office, mate? Are you care to divulge? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, you don't have uh, to. You don't have to. I've locked, well, I've locked myself out of the office again. I, I have had a few <laughs> and. Uh, it's a big office, a lot of people around, but no one on a Friday afternoon. I was like tapping on the glass. No, finished. Lucky I had my car keys on me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fair you having a you're having a bit of a Betty Crocker today, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I really wonder, you know, I, I used to lead teams to grand tour of victories, Dan. Can you believe that? I can't even find my, I my, can. my keys in my office. I can I can because <laughs> by you coming on the show so early, normally we've got a strict format. We talk to Whitey. Then we have a break, and then we bring our guests on, and then Scotty or Johnny does an intro to the guest. And one of the things that I love doing is I love getting on YouTube and just stealing vision. Now, I've stolen some vision <laughs> of you uh, for when you were inducted in the Australian Sports Hall of Fame, and I think Craig Willis does the, the voiceover for it. It's fantastic, so we might as well play it now, and this will give the listeners a bit of background to why you are titled as an Australian cycling legend. In the pantheon of Australian cycling champions, Brad McGee rates amongst his country's finest. On the road and track, his versatility and outstanding record makes him one of the all-time greats. He was the first Australian to wear the leader's jersey in all three of the Grand Tours, the Tour de France, Giro d'Italia and Violetta a Spagna. He also beat the kings of the road for stage wins in both the Tour and the Giro. But it was on the track where his career began and blossomed. At age 19, he became a junior world champion and world record holder in Team's Pursuit, and a year later, at his Olympic debut in Atlanta in 1996, he won a pair of bronze medals. Shortly before the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, disaster struck. When Brad crashed during a training ride, surgeons inserted a plate and seven screws into a broken collarbone. Just 18 days later, he bravely shrugged aside his injuries and won a bronze medal for his country. 2002 was an extraordinary year. He won the World Individual Pursuit Crown, won his fifth Commonwealth Games gold medal, and took to the road to win stage seven of the Tour de France. It looks as though McGee is going to get the victory of his life. Bradley McGee, the Australian, takes it on the line. A year later, he wore the Tour's coveted yellow jersey. Returning to the track, he won gold in team's pursuit at the 2004 Athens Olympics. Australia remained the champions of the world at this sport and silver in the individual pursuit, beaten only by the legendary Bradley Wiggins. Two great friends from Australia and Great Britain. In a career without blemish, his record included four Olympic campaigns, five Olympic medals, including one gold medal, two world titles, and four Commonwealth Games golds. After putting his body through incredible stress for nearly two decades, McGee retired at the end of 2008, age 32. Ah, oh, what an intro. Unbelievable. Now, Craig Willis is awesome, but he can't Where'd you find that, Dan? It's on YouTube. It's only had 10 hits. We need to get that going. So if you search Bradley <laughs> McGee, it's true. <laughs> Seriously. You need to, but, yeah, 10 hits. So I looked at him going, this is gold. How come this I'll, hasn't gone viral? I'll have, I'll have to tell my mum. She'll tell all the friends. We'll get you know, we'll get at least, yeah. at least a dozen by the end of the night, I reckon. Oh, for sure, for sure. Get on YouTube, check it out, search Bradley McGee, Australian Sports Hall of Fame, and then you go. But um, Craig Willis, you can't pronounce Giro. It's Giro, and the Vuelta, I think he stumbled over as well. But uh, other than that, it sounded awesome. Great but, voice, uh, mate, voice. tell you what, yeah. mate, you know, just, just, just on that, that bike in Atlanta, you know, if you go back, there was a, there was a, there was a web from Atlanta. That bike was seen on the net just recently. Someone's got it. Flogging it off for $30,000. 
You're joking. Yeah. How did they get their hands on it? I it's mean, not Shane Bannon. Scooter, is it? how much did you, get, did you get for your Olympic bike? Hey, you would have you got to double that, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Mine, mine's um, mine's actually under the bed. I've got it under the bed, it's protected. Right. But um, yeah, but but that was a special bike. That was the old, the super bike, and obviously you know with a metal attached to it as well. But uh, beautiful machine. But thirty grand. See, bikes stand. You know, cars and all these things, Ferraris and all that stuff. You know, a lot of these special vehicles go up in price dramatically. Bikes typically mm. don't. So secondhand bikes, mm. you, you get them for virtually nothing, unless it's Eddie Merckx's bike or, or obviously Brad McGee's bike. They're the only things that actually go up in value, which is pretty cool. That was a horrible bike. Horrible. <laughs> the most uncomfortable thing I've ever ridden. <laughs> it's, it's, it, hey, look, up, but... it's 19 and a half thousand now. It's just plummeted. <laughs> hey, hey, with that video, um, the, yep. so 2004 um, Olympic Games, um, Bradley Wiggins wins the, the individual pursuit over over Brad. Now, Brad gets mm. a gold in the team pursuit. But I know, and I've spoken to Wigo, um, he said that that was one of the most special things that he's done in his career. Now, he won you know, five gold medals, I think it was, at the Olympic Games, Tour de France as well. But he, he puts down uh, that particular race against Brad because he saw Brad as just a superstar of pursuiting as one of his absolute um, most cherished moments which is what a sign of respect to you, Brad, that, uh, you know, Sir Bradley Wiggins puts down that victory over you as, as one of his most cherished moments. Um, yeah. So you, you were you were an iconic rider, mate, back in the day, that's for sure. Thanks, Scooter. Yeah, thanks, mate. Keep it coming. If anything else? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll back up and go four years before that. Let's go four years before that, right? So um, Wigo is in the I'm Madison joking. Olympic I'm Games. Joking. <laughs> no, no, this is an interesting story, right? So we go um, ride the Madison at the Olympic Games in Sydney, which, of course, you know, um, Brett Aiken and, and I come away with the, the gold medal. But they were in the bronze medal position. Rob Howells and Bradley Wiggins were sitting in the bronze medal position coming to the final sprint. It was double points on offer for the final sprint. And I was coming down the finishing straight in fourth position. We, were, we had an unbeatable lead going into that final sprint, so we didn't need any points. I threw my arms up halfway down the finishing straight to celebrate our victory. That allowed mm -hmm. the Italian team of Martinello and Villa to come over the top of me, pick up the final two points on offer. That put them into the bronze medal position and up onto the podium. Now, Rob Howells and Brad Wiggins had both berated me for celebrating too early <laughs> and costing them a bronze medal. Back then... I said to them that the Italians were obviously superstars of the track. Martinello, points racer, Madison world champion with, with Marco Villa as well, multiple times. And I said that the podium in Sydney looked much better with me and Brett, Etienne de Wilder and Matthew Gilmore for Belgium, Martinello and Villa for Italy. That was a better podium than having the two British twats up there in third place. <laughs> and I've always joked about that until Brad won the Tour de France in 2012. And I thought, what an <laughs> idiot I was for celebrating too early. I could have had Brad Wiggins on the podium. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, boys, yeah, we've got another Brad special Wiggins. guest. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but poor Robbie, he oh, for the bronze in the IP then as well. Mate, he'd, he'd be still with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. JT. <laughs> JT. How are you, John? Uh, you got right, your mate. dressing gown on. You're hanging in there, mate. Yeah, a bit of crook. But uh, when I knew that Bradley was on, I had to come on and say hi because I've got the fondest memories of that. Uh, that two was it two thousand and four zero, I think it was when you uh, had the uh, pink jersey. It was just the most there amazing trip. Yep. We had a motley crew. It of was, Aussie. mate. It was a special time. Yeah. It was. And so it was. It was Al. We made Al. God rest his soul. Good Tony McKee. Mar Wilson, I can't remember, a couple of others. And not only did we do the whole Giro, just as Motley crew, but we managed to stay in the same hotel with you on many, many <laughs> days. We'd be having breakfast with you. You'd be bringing me over the special cereals that you guys were having. It was just a wonderful trip. And uh, But that's the fun side of it. But I, uh, I haven't been as impressed with many bike riders as I was with you in that one, Bradley, because... Yeah, you, know, you got the pink jersey, and then you fought on, and you weren't really thought of that at that time to be a GC contender, you know. But you just kept fighting. I remember watching you up a couple of times. The motor rollers one that sticks out. You know, you weren't far mm. off the 
group and you are digging in like, I thought, this, this is going to be the last day you can do this. You know, you're just digging in, digging in. And you, and you got through it. You kept doing it and kept doing it. So, yeah, I was very impressed. Yeah, it's, um, the only way I survived those climbs was with some pretty um, hair-raising descent to get back in. Uh, it was by the skin of teeth sometimes. <laughs> Tracking yeah, it. Good time, JT. Good times. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've all been involved with the Tour de France, you know, yourself, and I'd done a few by then. But the Giro, just, it just seemed like you get, you know, just accessible. You know, yeah, you guys were at, literally at our breakfast. Table. We, we could have a have a yarn after dinner at night and you know like the accessibility was right there it was like we're all in it together uh, whereas in the tour de france of course you get nowhere near like that uh, that that connectivity yeah, beautiful and, race and a great beautiful great time as they say. Yeah. but um <laughs> i do remember I, I also remember jt that on the not the penultimate night um we started to actually early and uh, maybe have a few bevies and talk about the, the great three weeks we just experienced and i think you thankfully for you you, you called it the older wiser statesman you said listen this is not over there's still a stage you boys better get to bed so thanks for that mate. i was <laughs> a bit rusty as it was <laughs> yeah, first time he's ever said that you want to go yet yeah. Know, yeah. Well, it was it was amazing <laughs> and i remember carl wilson ended up uh being somehow there was a relationship there from his, from his father. Of, I, I can't, we all come out in, in the wash, but uh, yeah, sensational time. Right. And, uh, yeah. and if you would have been there at the tour when Brad took pulled on the yellow jersey? I was. I, I, that was uh, super, super uh, uh, amazing. I remember that day because we were walking, the crowd was just enormous, and we were walking in this crowd, and, and the guy... Just mm. up in front of us, Tim the vet uh, is a bit taller. Notice this guy, and we're talking thousands of people. You notice the wallet full out of his back pocket. And he went, Hey, mate. And being an Aussie, the guy turned around. You dropped your wallet. And it was, it was, um, <laughs> Cookie's dad, big, big Cook's dad. And uh, <laughs> so we, we carted them off into a, into a bar, and he was so appreciative, you know, because he never would have seen it again. And everything in there, um, yeah, and we, we uh, got them on the turps for a couple of days and just about destroyed them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, one of wonderful memories. One of my one of my great memories of that though was was you the, the stage you led out a, a cookie. You're in the yellow jersey. You let it out. Cookie's mm. a bit too back. And the way you just managed that, you went from side to side, propped early, we had them all just too far for everyone to go, let Cookie come with a run. It was one of the most brilliant tactical sprints I've ever seen. Remember it well. Oh, okay. He loved the long sprint. You, you couldn't stop him from jumping early, so we just went a bit earlier than everyone else. Yeah. That was a good time. <laughs> hey, Brad. Um, Okay, eighth in the Giro d'Italia, um, stage wins in all, in all of them, and the first, as we heard from from Craig Willis, the first Australian to wear the leaders' jersey in all three Grand Tours. You got the team pursuit from the Olympics. You were, you know, you, I, I found this fascinating. Commonwealth Games, you've got five medals, all of them gold. So you know, you, you've had a, a stellar mm. career. Then also as a, a, a sports director as well as a race director, you retired very young in terms of professional cycling, went straight into being a race director. What are your best memories? What do you really think about, you know, these years on now that you're a long time out of the, the racing side of things? You know, think of the, the connections you hold now. Um, you know, um, you're, you're part of it there, um, Scotty. We've got the um, uh, Graham Brown initiative with the WhatsApp group and the monthly call-in with that, that old set from, you know, those uh, early Olympic um, campaigns. And that's... You hold dear to that, you know, those times, the build-up, before anything really happened, you know, you're just training your ass off and, you know, hanging up your mates and, and trying really hard. You didn't know what was it. They, they were golden moments. And, and to be real connected with those those guys and girls from that from their era, that's, you hold that really, really dear to your heart. And you know, the rest is you just, you just got to be, the, um, you know, um, thankful that you had the capacity to, to do all those amazing things and experience all those it was amazing events. Um, yeah, I really couldn't single anything out there. Just, just deeply great, uh, grateful I had the, the capacity to do it and support to do it. It was amazing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, shared moments. It's amazing, isn't it? Bet, you know, obviously, the team pursuit with those boys, with you know Lancaster Brownie, Luke Roberts. You know, there's cherished moments mm. that you guys have. A, it's like we, you know, for Brett Aiken and I. If I enter a room, I don't see Brett that often. Okay, so if I do see him at a cycling event or an awards or whatever it may be, it's a look across the room and just an acknowledgement that we're both there, and a you know okay. bit of a nod. You know, I'll catch up with you soon. I'm busy at the moment, or he's coaching, or whatever it is at the national championships. I might be commentating. Can't talk to you right now, but there's just that little acknowledgement that we know what we share together and that mutual respect, which yeah. obviously you have as well. One of the things for you, Brad, that has always stuck in my mind is it got mentioned in that clip this uh, briefly that you crashed in training while we we're in Adelaide before the Sydney Olympic Games and three weeks later picked up mm. the bronze medal in the individual pursuit. And and I remember being out there on the road with you that day that you crashed and thinking, oh, my God, this is it. You know, <laughs> like your Olympic dream is over, yet you still picked up probably not the medal you were looking for, but a medal at the Olympic Games three weeks after breaking your collarbone. And, and yeah, the, the utmost respect. And, the, and it's those shared experiences that I sort of reflect on, you know, as I get older and have obviously lost all my hair and become an old, an old man. But, um, yeah, man, you've, you've had an incredible career and, and showed an enormous amount of courage. Yeah. I remember that day, Scotty, um, I think Michael Rogers was holding me in his arms and he put his hand up under the jersey and felt the, the bone and you're trying to say, are you right, it's probably just bruised. And, and I remember Mick looking at you and just shaking his head as if I could see it. But Mick was like, no, nah, it's done. No, um, it's done. Fortunately, it's, they it's patched me up pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Like, nah, he's bugging. They like, threw yeah. a patch in it pretty quick and I was on the track you know, three or four days later. That was an amazing ride, yeah. That time. Yeah, it was amazing. And, and, and hey, that, again, what, that was the whole team support. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, what about the Giro itself? Have you been watching? You know, you're a pretty man. So, have you been able to actually catch up with with the Giro? I haven't actually watched enough of the Giro this year. Um, I'm, I'm sort of holding out, um, saving my legs, I guess, for the tour. I need to actually uh, for for some of the rules, I, I need to pay attention to that one. But the Giro always holds a special place. You know, it's on. Um, you know, the experience I had. I went from finishing dead last in 2000 to finishing top ten. You know, um, four four years later. Um, and interestingly, I don't know if it's well known, but I and I don't know if you knew this at the time, but I wasn't even supposed to finish that Giro. I was only on halfway. I had tickets to the Monaco Grand Prix, Prix to get back to. And like halfway in, I'm sitting third place on GC. I, go, oh, I was stuck there. <laughs> I had to box onto the end. <laughs> Did you scalp the tickets? You had to get rid of them, unload them. Could have got a bit of money for those. So I had this conversation. With Tom and Gerrans the other day, and he he reckons he ended up getting my tickets to the Grand Prix. Yeah, all these years later, he, he bothered to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, incredible. Hey, Brad, um, how did you I'll go get checks in after, the after cycling? You, you've obviously done a lot of work, you know, you DSing and, and working for, you know, federations and so forth. How does that compare to racing? Oh, I can tell you. I mean, there. Look at that. That's in um, Tour of Qatar. You know, you're in. You know, you're just so complex. And I think most athletes that have gone into that directing, coaching, management space, the first thing they realise is, bloody hell, didn't didn't I know you guys did so much work. You know, the behind the scenes work is just insane. But every Grand Tour I finished as a DS, I was more um, emotionally and psychologically drained than any of the ones I finished as a bike rider. You know, I literally had, would stay in the hotel for another 24 hours, close the door, close the windows, room service to recover so I can go home and actually be a you know, father and a, and, a, and a husband in some capacity. You're just absolutely exhausted. The campaign starts so far out with all the recon and all the planning and the staffing and, and the, the, the communication level is insane. The amount of work that goes into it. You know, I spent five years there in that sports director capacity with, with Saxo. Um, and you know, look at these, um, some of the, the people involved been in there, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know how they do it. It is draining. It's exhausting. Mm. Well, I, uh, I've got to say, Bradley, that obviously was true some of the time, but I'm going to pull you up on that because I can remember a couple of times where uh, that next day you didn't lock yourself away. You joined us for lunch 
and some of them were quite <laughs> legendary. Was the day after that? The day after the last. <laughs> <laughs> Need a recovery yeah. time from the lunch oh, itself. That, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was the rose lunch. Oh, Great good. times. It is true, though, isn't it, Brad? Because the, as a rider, I've been in a similar situation since I've stopped in doing different things. And when I was hosting, you know, full cycle TV show and and other commentary things, you as a rider, you know that you have to train hard, you prepare for it, and recovery is so important. And recovery means making sure that you switch off your mind, go to sleep, get as much recovery as you can before the next day's training. And at the end of the day, there's nothing more you can do other than go to sleep. And actually recover for the next day now post racing career it's thinking all the time have i done enough research have i thought about this and it's hard to switch your brain off and i guess that's what you're referring to isn't it that the rider yeah sure it's it's bloody hard you know to be a professional um athlete in any sport so physically super tough tough mindset to do it but they get to actually just switch their minds off every afternoon once the racing's done or the training's done but for the ds's and for the other people around the scenes, mate, the mind just, it's hard to turn the mind off. So uh, were you able to find a way to do that eventually or is that something that's still a challenge to actually switch the mind off to make sure you recover? Yeah. And, and it's still a thing I, I can do. So what I would say was... Uh, say, we're having a few audio problems. Hear me, boys? Yeah, it's it's cutting it a bit in and out. See if you can work out a way to turn your mic off the car one. I reckon that's the problem. I'll, I'll set you a challenge, Brad. Now, what we can do while you're fixing that, Ify, um, how are you travelling, mate? Do you want to stay on or? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. This has revitalised me. Okay, perfect. Well, what we'll do is we'll do a quick word from our great mates at uh, Bike Exchange because – what you're saying, Brad's gold. So we don't want it cutting in and out. And then we'll see if we can fiddle with the audio stuff. And then we'll come back after that. And we've also got an interview that I uh, did earlier with sports director Matt White. So quick word from Bike Exchange. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs. Semi-amateurs. And pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank. And these bars. This could be the perfect match. But not this one. This girl has a bike to sell. And thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers yours and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving we are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike bike exchange where the world buys sells learns and rides thanks again to bike exchange what are you eating scooter looks nice um, banana bread Sandy made me some banana bread, so I was, I was trying to get that down. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. Wait, before we get back on camera, sorry. <laughs> you got about four bits in. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear us, I can you hear us Brad? Eaten. I haven't eaten since when uh, since Sunday. Oh, well. Mate, you'll be, you'll, be the, you'll be in the front group soon if you keep going yeah, like I'll, that. I'll be climbing the Pyrenees soon, yeah. <laughs> We've had a comment from Kiwi Cat says, get well soon if you take care of yourself. Uh, Rick Adams says, good that Whitey didn't have to learn netball rules, obviously with Remco abandoning from the race. Uh, we've got a question for Brad, but I think his screen's frozen now, so that I tried to fix the audio and I've completely wiped him out. It says, could I ask Bradley how they picked the Olympic teams for the Olympic road race? How is it we can only send four riders? COVID? I think that's standard, isn't it? No, no. So five is standard. And Brad, if we can get Brad back, he'll... he'll because he has been involved with all of that. Five riders are standard. It comes down to how many um, spots we qualify. And as a nation, we've been very good over the years, but the last uh, couple, we haven't been as competitive um, as we'd like to be. So we haven't been able to qualify the maximum number of five riders. 
All right, well, why don't we play the first part of Whitey's interview because obviously everyone's interested at such an epic stage 19 today. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, part one. There's two parts and uh, we obviously chat about what he thinks is going to happen on stage 19. You can finish off that banana bread and if you okay. try to pour yourself a hot tea or something and let's get going. Whitey, these moments... I mean, when I was on the ground, I couldn't contain my excitement, mate. I was just absolutely fizzing. Um, and obviously, you know, with Yatesy, you knew it was going to be a title fight. You knew it was going to go to the end. But uh, the, what's the overall emotion in the group at the moment? Really good. Really good, Dan. Yeah, the ride that the boys put together the other day, uh, you know, off the back of a rest day, everyone's been up and about. And, and you know, we had one big ride. The, the momentum just flows and uh, everyone knows that our leader's in a really good place uh, and at the best time of the race and that's the tail end where it's going to matter the most. Now, one thing I used to love doing, particularly on the backstage, is I'd have movie analogies. Now, I've got one that I reckon summarises just after the team meeting today. And that is, of course, Rocky 2. Now, Yates is going to be Rocky, you're Adrian, and Jerry's in the background. He's the old trainer, Mickey. So I just want to play this epic clip from Rocky too. You look so tired. Why don't you go get some sleep? Oh, no, no, I feel great. I feel great. There's one thing I want you to do for me. What? Come here. What? Win. Win. What are we waiting for? Take us! Mate, this is it. (laughs) This is it. We've got three rounds to go. We knew Drago was going to be dominant at the start, but with three rounds, he was a bit wobbly on his feet. What is the instructions today, Whitey? What are we going to say to the boys? Well, I wasn't out chasing chickens this morning, but uh, I went for a good run. Now, and now the big thing, that Jonesy, the big thing that's changed there, Jonesy, is that that category one climb in the middle is gone. Yeah. So that's that's a category four climb now, which is really nothing. So it, and the stage is shortened by I think fifteen kilometres. So it's basically a flattish stage until kilometre one twenty. Then we've got the cat two, and then the descent, and then you haven't got too much time onto the final climb. And the final climb it's may not be as hard as the other day when Yatesy ripped it a new one, but it is it is hard. It is a very hard climb, and especially in the last three to four kilometres. And at the end of the day, if we uh, if we want to win this Giro, we um, we have to uh, we have to put pressure on our rivals, and we're we're looking forward and not backwards. That's for sure, mate. What are you expecting from the other teams? Knowing, and we mentioned this yesterday, that there was some weaknesses shown, and it's the first time in the whole Giro with Bernal. What do you think the other teams are going to be trying to do as well? Yeah, it, it, it's hard. It depends on it depends on how much certain. Riders with other other wheels falling off, or did they just have a bad day? And and only those teams and those those individuals know that. But um, it, it's all got to be measured as well. At the end of the day, we, we, we've got to be we've got to be calm, and also we've got to whatever we do has got to be the best thing for Simon this afternoon or or tomorrow. So you know we've got a big buffer back to fourth place. Uh, we're only a minute off second place, and and we have, if we wanted to. To finish second, we'd also we need a lead going into the time trial over Cruzo. Cruzo's a better time trialer than than Simon, but it's also he's going into uncharted territories as well. He's never led a team in a Grand Tour. He's a very very good bike rider, very consistent. But he he, he came to this race to help Michael Lander and found himself in a situation where he's in second place. And now he, there's a guy who's finished in the top ten in the Giro, the Tour, and I think the Vuelta as well. So he's an experienced hand campaigner, very 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 consistent. And then Bernal, well, he's won a Grand Tour. Uh, I said for a long time, it's it's his race to lose. It's his race to lose. They've they've got the strongest team here. They've got the biggest budget in the world of cycling, and uh, they expect to win. And uh, they've been in pole position for a long time now, and it's up to them to hold it. You're talking about the momentum sort of swing, and and obviously that ride of Yates the other day is is pumped a lot of uh, positive momentum in the team. But on the flip side, can it have an adverse effect because over the years, when a rider's cracked on a stage and only lost, you know, a minute or so, it doesn't. It's very rare that that just turns around. So, do you think in the in the Ineos camp, you know, on the flip side, that can play tricks on you uh, mentally, particularly going into these massive stages? Yeah, look, 
I, I don't know. I don't know Bernal well enough, or I don't know, and I don't really know any of their riders well enough, mate. And I, all I know is how how we work on this team and and how we manage certain situations, and uh, that's what matters for us at the moment. How we go forward in these couple of days, but you know, it would be it wouldn't be a nice feeling um, to be so dominant for for such a big period of the race, and then uh, and then have a bad day. But uh, how people handle those adversities is what makes champions, isn't it? And what is the weather conditions today? Sensational. Uh, another warm one, mid 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 to high twenties. So same as yesterday, 26, 27. Really, really nice weather. If, but thank God because we've had a pretty average. <laughs> we've had a pretty average Giro. We've had a pretty average Giro weather wise, and it looks like uh, it looks like spring and summer is is finally arrived for us. And are we expecting those sort of conditions for tomorrow and the time trial? Yeah, t- tomorrow, yes. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a small chance we might get rain um, on Sunday for the TT, but it's you know it's a 30k TT, it's 38, 39 minutes. It's not very technical, and most people will be hoping that the time trial result is not going to affect your placing. You know, you know, if you've got a 30 to 40 second buffer on most guys, that's pretty much where you'll stay. Um, so we're just focusing on today for today, but the weather's the weather looks good for the next 48 hours and. Uh, I said, if it's wet on Sunday, it is, it is what it is. So, um, obviously, last time I asked you a stupid question, like, you know, what do you what do you want to achieve today? And obviously, you know, winning the stage would be nice. But uh, in terms of a buffer, um, going into, obviously, stage 20, which we've spoken so many times, is just rude. Um, what would be a realistic scenario in terms of the, there's still a chance to win this Giro after the finish today? Well, I think we saw. I think we saw a couple of years ago. Anything can happen. Anything can happen, and has happened uh, over the years. So, when if people blow, they blow. Uh, if it's uh, if it's in the last week of a tour, if people have bad days. You, know, you can lose. I think. I think Cadell Evans when he when he in the Giro in two thousand and two or three, he had the leaders jersey with uh, one or two days to go and lost fifteen minutes on one stage. So. Anything's possible. Anything's possible, uh, and it, it isn't over until uh, we cross the finish line in Milan. And uh, the roles for the guys in the rest of the team, obviously, you know, Happy um, Cam and Yul Jensen, and that were really good in the early stages. Are they going to be sort of on the front doing similar things for today? I wouldn't be surprised if you see a bit of them uh, getting their face in the wind today, some to- at some point of the day. And uh, and then we've got to see. We've got you know we've lost Schultze, and also we've. Uh, Mikhail Never, he's uh, he's still injured from the crash from a couple of days ago, and uh, our medical staff will be treating him this morning and taking him for a checkup, and uh, hopefully he's going to be okay to start to start the stage today. But regardless, um, yeah, it is what it is. We're, we're we're working with the resources we've got, and we're looking, and we've got forty eight hours to manage it. That's all. All right, that was part one of the chat with uh, Whitey. Um, what are your key takeaways from that one, Ify? From part one of it, yeah. Look, you spot on, really, isn't he? He's just uh, he's just nailed it. You can tell they're going to ride this stage just like they did two days ago. Um, what would you change? What worked? So keep me close. Um, give you eight your chance for a stage victory. Um, the extra ten seconds as well, uh, and try and crack him earlier. I reckon. I reckon he'll go a fraction earlier, not three forty k to go. I reckon he'll probably go. About six k to go, and try yep. and get another minute. That's where I think it will happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've lost Brad McGee. Unfortunately, my uh, I'm a bit pedantic with the audio, and that's cost us. <laughs> he's got to he's got to <laughs> fix it, and we've lost him completely. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things, most impressive things with that, that with Brad that he managed to do was he managed to you know, FDJ one of the big uh, uh, French teams who aren't normally famous for uh, you know, moving outside of France as far as their, you know, what, what they do. But to get them to come over and be a part of the Australian, the New South Wales Institute FDJ Development Squad, that was a huge step. Uh, and it was done because of their respect for Bradley. So uh, it was quite amazing, actually. Um, I wanted to have a to about that, but we can bring that up another time. Well, that's my I was, fault. Uh, I, I, I popped into uh, 
I had to pop in the hospital last night to try and sort out my little issues. And, I, and I, the young doctor looking after me, his name was Jonathan, and he was an ex-bikey, raced at Carnegie and whatever, he loved the bikes. Uh, and he hadn't heard of the detour. But uh, I, I said to him, and he went to school with, with Matty Lloyd. And I said, well, we've got Matty Lloyd on as a... Uh, as a guest t tomorrow night. He said, oh, great, I'll watch that. So, sorry, Jonathan, he's tomorrow night, but you'll have to watch it again. So, yeah. yeah, sorry about that, hey, mate. Well, when Noel Sense just, quick, just quickly says, the detour is a great show. Brad McGee is an absolute legend, but I'm worried about the general of the show. Get Will soon, John. John, I'm going to have to call it, mate. You need to go rest up. I don't want to cook your biscuits. We've got two massive stages of the Giro to come. I need you as fresh as possible. So go get the hot water bottle. Rest up, enjoy. Scooter and I have wrapping up the show, and uh, we'll, we'll see you bigger and better tomorrow and uh, Sunday, mate. Thanks, fellas. I just thought I'd just jump on so people yep. didn't forget me. All right, mate. <laughs> Good <laughs> on you, Fee. Rest up, mate. We'll speak to you soon. See you, mate. Cheers, yeah. mate. Cheers, mate. What, what were you going to say, Scooter? Uh, I've forgotten now. Okay, well, we'll keep moving on. Thoughts. Matthew says, uh, <laughs> <laughs> warm and sunny, warm and sunny. Yates is going to kill it. Oh, well, he's correcting himself the next one, warm and sunny, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah well, hey, look, you know Whitey, right? Oh, no, sorry, keep going there. So, I'll go back on I was just, all right, so Free Ranger says, I thought Bernal didn't look happy during yesterday's flattish stage. Put the pressure on Whitey, he'll crack. Uh, and then... Uh, Jay Slice Bike says it will be interesting to see if Yates has legs over the weekend to really challenge Banal. Correct. Yeah, and and so it's we're looking at the time trial he has to be in front. So if he wants to actually win the Giro, okay, you got Crusoe who we think is a better time trial. Banal and and Simon are pretty similar in terms of time trials. They've sort of duped out a few times, um, and they've raced each other four times. We mentioned this yesterday, and each of them have won twice so they're absolutely even in terms of time trialing but you'd want to have an advantage wouldn't you to be over caruso and of course over bernal which means he's got two mountain stages to get an advantage and he's coming from a fair way back at three minutes 20 whatever it is 323 23. behind yep. um so he can't wait till the final stage he's got to have a real crack tonight to see yep. if bernal's on his you know he's on his knees and then you know put the, the final dagger in on that crazy final uh, penultimate stage tomorrow so i think there should be some fireworks tonight uh, i think john's right in that simon needs to attack early do you consolidate where you're at on the podium of a grand tour or do you actually go for no. the win and he could finish fifth he could finish he could completely blow but i prefer to see simon really try and light it up and just see what happens um, to go for the win and, you know, whether he blows up or not and finishes fifth overall, so be it. But uh, I reckon he really needs to give it a real crack. Um, well, that and that starts tonight. That reminds me, we've spoken about it on this show before when Bules was on for the tour, is that stage 20 of the Vuelta when Esteban was a minute 30 down behind Contador in the penultimate stage and they made up that time and they were talking on the bus beforehand. It was exactly what you just said. Do we consolidate and accept that we've got a top five? Awesome, or do we just go all out? And if I blow, don't worry about top five, I'll finish 20th. Like I'm going all chips in. And Chavez stood up and he said, Guys, who cares? We fight, we don't sit back, we fight, we go for it. Because they were sort of they, they'd made the call, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll be happy with you know, fourth. And when Chavez got up and said that, and the whole group, the whole bus, like I remember Bill stood up and goes, Yeah, and then everyone was cheering. I was like, How good's this? And, like, just roll the dice, you know, just go for it. That's the whole Rocky speech. We just got to go for it, yeah. And they've got that that catalyst now, that sort of carrot is there that Egan wasn't great the last time they went up a mountain. Um, he, We were talking him up. Everyone was talking him up as if, as if he was unbeatable. Remember we put up the uh, the Muhammad Ali quote a couple of days ago, you know, if you even – if you dream about beating me, when you wake up, you should apologise to me for having that dream. Um <laughs> Yeah, and now we've moved on to, <laughs> hang on, this guy could actually get beaten. Wow. Um, yeah. it, it would be a massive turnaround for it to happen. But, uh, yeah, I think that's all that Simon has to do is is put it all on the table and just go for it, starting tonight um, and then into tomorrow. Hey, you have a bad day on that final, you know, mountain stage. You, there's how much, Who knows how much time can be lost on, on that particular day. It's so filthy. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. 
Hey, we didn't um we didn't touch on well, what I've went got, on I've, in the I've got part two because oh, yeah, I yeah. do touch on what happened with Sagan when I chat uh, with Whitey. Yeah, go for that. So, all right, here's part two of the chat with Matt White earlier today. Well, uh, mate, it's going to be a bloody epic stage. One of the other talking points was, um, just on a side note, oh, Sagan, he was fined for intimidation uh, yesterday. And I was could I said to Scooter, geez, if, if they were handing out those sort of fines back in the 90s and early 2000s for Chippo at the Giro, <laughs> he'd be bloody broke. Like, uh, have you ever seen a, a rider fine for intimidation at a race before? Oh, the sport is very different, isn't it? Uh, isn't it, mate? And, and the thing that changes, uh, and look, it's, it, it, a lot of it has changed for the good. A lot of it has changed for the good. Um, but uh, I, I actually didn't see the incident that uh, that he was fined for. Um, I didn't. I didn't read it. I didn't pay too much attention to it actually. But I didn't see why, what kind of an intimidation it was. Um, but. You know, now the riders are under the microscope. You know, it's live television, start to finish. So, uh, yeah, everything they do is scrutinised. And uh, I, look, the UCI are trying to make the sport a safer sport and and all of that. But uh, you know, it's just, I, I, sometimes there's always got to be a bit of context to uh, to those stories, and I don't know if they always get the context right. Yeah, but I mean, like, it opens up the doors for other riders now to go, hey, hey, he intimidated me. Who was it? Was it? It's like the old writing the numbers down in footy, getting the report card yeah. out. Yeah, like primary school. Yeah. <laughs> I do, you, you get snitches in the peloton now. <laughs> snitches get stitches, mate. Snitches hey, I just, uh, People will be going back to the GoPros for file footage. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's funny on that, the Valon, how many times do riders get tripped up with those back cameras? With the audio now, where you can hit the, hear the sounds in the race. Obviously, you know, ten years ago, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's uh, it's, it's, it's is it the sport's a different place. The sport is a different place. The uh, the guys are under the micro, uh, microscope twenty four seven. Um, and just on yesterday's stage, you said uh, before the start you would have been happy if a break went away. You would have been happy with how it all sort of panned out. Um, mm. That they what did they get in the end twenty three minutes. At one point, I fell asleep on the couch. Woke up at 4 a.m. with Czechoslovakian news on. But uh, it was a pretty boring <laughs> stage. And, and I saw they stitch you on the uh, backstage. They, they got you with the nod. And, and thanks to Maka, he made you show some teeth and gave you the bump so that they could line it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, look, it, was, it was a long day. And after, look, after the break had gone, we obviously had no interest in being in the break. It, it was a pretty exciting final for the, for the 20, 23 guys fighting it out for the win. But um, there was a there, this is put it that way. There was a fair bit of dead time for us between when that break went until we arrived on the circuit, and then we had to turn the switch on and and uh, just ride. We were just ride good position for safety and mitigate risk until we got through into the final. And I think I'm not sure where that where that shot was, but there was a few there was uh, there was a few times a day yesterday where I was uh, I was in a bit in the hurt bag, mate. It was just a Long straight roads, mm. not too much, no information to give the boys. They knew the, the next bottle point was in 30k. No corners, no nothing. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was it was a quiet day in the car. But a, a quiet day is a good day when you're riding GC. I reckon the worst race I ever saw for that was remember that Tour of Alberta, and it was like 180 k's, and there was four corners in the entire stage. It was like I do. dead straight 100k. I think the car smelled of uh, raw meat. Because we were eating about eight bags of jerky at the time, but and the, and then we then we had that stars yeah who ripped the skin off and they wrapped him yeah, up the, like a the, mummy. The, the, the Korean the Korean stars yeah, and uh, yeah. I remember the story well. Remember he uh, we gave him we gave him kit because he was star he was star sharing and he and uh, he's such a polite young man. He when we gave him the kit, I think we gave him medium gloves and and. Uh, and medium gloves didn't fit him, but he didn't actually didn't actually tell us that that you know, that we could he have small. Anyway, so the first road stage, we uh, we're out there and we hear uh, we hear Orica Orica to the back of the, to, the, to the group crash. We get to the feed zone and uh, remember we we caught him and he had his mm. feed bag had his feed bag hanging around his neck and he's he's going up the side of the bunch there and he had skin off everywhere on what one side and uh, his skin he didn't he didn't wear the gloves. Um, because they were too big. Anyway, he, uh, I was like, "Ooh, this is uh, this is not good." Anyway, th- th- he was a tough, he was a tough one. He got to the finish, finished the stage, at all navigated around all four corners and uh, the stage, and then we got him, took him, and went to the hospital. 
they clean him up. And I remember going up, pick him up to the hospital. It wasn't that far from the hotel. And he finished stage and said, oh, look, you know, we can, uh, have, a, we can have a look at uh, getting your flight home in a, in a couple of days, mate. And, uh, and uh, you know, feeling sorry for him. I said, you know, you did, you know, it's not your fault. And, you know, accidents happen. Right, you're right. He said, no, 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 no. I must continue. I must yeah. continue. <laughs> And, and he came, he came, he came out of the hospital like just like a mummy. He they looked like a burns up. victim. They, like he he, was they, literally they, like they wrapped him up like a mummy. Anyway, we were talking to him because he didn't have, a, he actually didn't have too much experience racing in Europe, and, and the racing that he had done in Asia, he he, he hadn't done many, if any, feed bags. But he also he didn't tell us. So he's take, he's what it happened is he's taken the feed bag, but then he's dropped himself on the side of the road, and those roads in Alberta were like. Aussie, uh, oh. Aussie, Aussie country roads, and because he didn't have any gloves on, it's probably the worst place to lose skin as a bike rider because you've got to hold the handlebars for the rest of the week. And I remember he was so tough. He got through the race, and I remember one stage in the crosswinds, he was just so keen to impress, and he got through the whole race and, and did some really good work for the team. Um, and then he went and rode the world championships in the time trial. Where, but um, I can't remember his name, but he uh, he was he was one tough character, one tough character, and uh, yeah, I don't know how why why people don't race with gloves on, but that's the number one reason why you don't is when you do crash and you land awkwardly, you, yeah, you can rip the skin off your hands, and it makes life very hard for yourself to to continue racing. But uh, yeah, Tour of Alberta, the uh, the courses um, they weren't the most uh, oh, lovely race, lovely race, but uh, they weren't the most riveting, were they? No, some of, those prairie, some of those prairie roads out in the middle no. of nowhere. But they have bloody good shopping centres. Remember, we went to that one that at one point was the world's biggest, and we got yep. lost. Like it was in Edmonton. Huge. In Edmonton, yeah. it had, the, had the roller coaster inside and the water slide. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I remember Fumi Beppu was leaving the team, and he said to Joachim, "Like it just came out." And Joachim looked at Fumi, and goes, "Ah, oh, just don't talk to you again." And he was joking, but Fumi took it really to heart after that. Hey, did you know, uh, Joachim didn't mind. Joachim didn't mind a prank or two, did he? Nah, nah. He didn't nah. mind a prank. Well, 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 actually, that was we, when we were in Alberta. That was when, remember, that was when they announced that t- Tokyo got the Olympic Games. Yeah, we're so starving for content, remember? We said, how are we, we going to wrap we this? Did. Nothing happened. There was four corners. We said, oh, Tokyo won the Olympics. Why don't we talk to Bepson and pump it up? <laughs> and so yeah. we did. Hey, we made it. Hey, you to celebrate, Beppu. Yeah! It's the honor of announcing that the Games of the 32nd Olympiad in 2020 are awarded to the city of Tokyo. The last two until, minutes. Until, until the IOC got onto the fact you were using. <laughs> International vision and the video the was blocked. International vision of the Olympic Games. Yeah, the video was blocked in 246 countries. <laughs> so. I think it went up for an. It went up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was up for yeah, ten minutes, and then that was ten minutes. It. I, it was one of the one of, yeah. It was. It was. I think it was around a thirteen or fifteen minute one as well. Yeah, yeah good times. But anyway. Well, hopefully today's good times, Whitey. We wish you all the best uh, with the boys today. And, geez, we're going to be glued to the TV here cheering on. And that's it for now. How are you, mate? I'll, le- I'll let him go. So uh, all the best, mate. We'll check in again tomorrow. And, and hopefully we're in a really good position to uh, make an assault on uh, on this year's Giro. So all the best, mate. Yeah, thanks very much. No, it's going to be one exciting afternoon, that's for sure. Good luck. All right. See you, Dan. Geez, uh, that conversation sort of went off track a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> You're only just realising that now. How yeah. relaxed was he? Yeah, no, he's good. He's really relaxed. Um, mm. And it's good your size. Phone, your phone did ring a couple of times too, by the way. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, I did. We have had a few comments. Uh, we've got uh, Spook says, love your work, boys. Looking forward to having Yates on for a victory pod. Go the lads. I can tell you now, if Simon Yates wins this year, I don't think we're going to have a problem getting him on the show. Uh, and another one, Kim Dixon, good on you, Dan, for looking out for John. That's what I do. I'm a good guy. I'm very <laughs> concerned for our mate Iffy. All he needs is just a bit of a rest. Get him off the front. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas says, let's hope Yates ends the stage looking good. If Bernard looks even a little like John, bike exchange is in with a chance. Sorry, if you get well soon. <laughs> uh, Free Ranger says, uh, fine for intimidation, Lance would be bankrupt. I think that's a fair call. 
Uh, ben Lawson says, I think the thing is that we know that Ineos will control, but I think everyone has a bad day. I think if the jersey is going to change hands, it has to be something like Froome did. Uh, and then ICC says, I think Yates should do a bike change to a BMX before the big descents. And then he says, what do you guys think about my BMX idea? Um, I don't really rate it. I don't rate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't, that would give you a challenge, mate. A BMX on a descent on, on normal roads. Oof. Yeah. Don't know, don't know about that. Don't know about that no. one. <clears throat> so looking at your crystal ball scooter, obviously that climb's been taken out, but uh, what do you yeah. think is going to happen today? Uh, look, I, I think Simon's... Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see. Look, obviously a break will go early, right? So with that climb, with the Motorola, uh, Motorola out of it now, and you've got a very long flat section all the way through to that first hill, um, or the second hill that we see on the graphic. Um, so I think that opens it up for another breakaway group. Um, but as we saw, what Whitey did the other day with his boys at Mitchelton was okay. The break got up the road. That's the stage that Dan Martin won out of the breakaway group. But he put his guys on the front to uh, to make it as hard as possible all the way through to that final climb. I think it's something similar to that that they need to do um, to try and really make it difficult and, and challenge, uh, you know, not just Bernal in terms of the overall win, but also Caruso. They really do need to make sure they try and put uh, Caruso under the pump as well. And Bahrain are pretty limited now. They don't have that many riders uh, left in the race, um, you know. I think uh, you know that's what they need to do is is put everybody under pressure again, like they did in the last mountaintop finish. And then tomorrow for the final, you know, mountain stage, it's just put it all out there, absolutely, just open slather, go for it, um, and you know, just see what happens on Sunday. You know, when they wake up in the morning and see where the GC settles. Um, so I, I think bike exchange is going to be uh, pretty an animated, and I reckon. Just anybody that's watched the podcast throughout the Giro will get a bit of a feel, the ebbs and flows of Whitey in particular. Mm. And, you know, you can just tell on the days when he's really nervous, um, you know, that stage that Mark, Dan Martin won where Simon did so well, he was really up and about that morning. You know, yep. in the conversations we had with him, he was really happy. Now, after Simon struggled a bit a couple of days before that, you could tell Whitey was really down. The rest day he was really down. And he's back up again now, right? So that chat you had with him, you know, happy to talk about, you know, the Korean who he said he he was so respectful of because he showed so much courage, but he forgets his name and they didn't sign him for the next year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah, he was up and about and it just showed that he's, he's in really good spirits and I think they, they rate Simon's chances and I think that starts tonight. Yep, 100%. Uh, Samantha, last question says... Why was the stage changed? We covered this a couple of days ago, but obviously with the chairlift incident that happened on that climb, uh, and there's 14 people that died, so out of respect, they're going around yeah. uh, that climb. Yeah, it was only Samantha. It was only a couple of days ago that yeah, there was a, a chairlift that, that collapsed. So a cable car, um, the, the actual you know cable car unit fell um, and collapsed, and 14 people um, passed away. So now I don't know the circumstances around whether that actually meant the cable car went down over the road they're going to be coming up on that climb or not, or it was just out of respect that there was such a big tragedy on it that they don't want to take the race up there. I'm not sure what the circumstances around that are, but either way, um, I think the organisers have done the right thing to show the respects to, you know, the family of those that passed away only a couple of days ago. And, you know, this certainly would have been a spectacular climb in terms of the scenery, the racing. It's right next to Lake Maggiore. I lived just down the road from there uh, for a couple of years. You know, I remember um, uh, Simone, you know, going solo up over the Motorola. You know, Mick Rogers, who we've had on the show, used to train up there all the time when he lived and worked and rode for, for MAPE. So it would have been iconic, but there are bigger things going on other than a, a bike race and, and 14 people losing their lives, um, you know, in a tragic accident, I think is, is far more important. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and last one, Wombat Breath, thanks for the show. Exciting night's coming. Absolutely. Simon Yates is the favourite for the stage, as he well should be, because he is going to smoke it up on that last climb. And fingers crossed, he pulls some more time on Banal. As we always say, youtube.com forward slash the detour podcast. Like, share, subscribe, get behind it. Now, I thought, it, uh, why not finish? Again, if you're just tuning in, we played uh, Whitey a clip, and it was the Rocky Two analogy. 
Uh, Yates is Rocky. White is Adrian. Jerry's Mickey in the corner. And did you see you want to show that clip again? Yeah. It's fantastic. So before you do, if you're going to finish on that, yep. I, I, you know how I always like to try and throw in a bit of useless trivia? Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. So my, my little connection, I did mention the Sydney Olympic Games, Madison, not for my benefit. We're talking about conversation with Brad McGee. And I mentioned the Italians that went in from fourth into third place because of my early celebration. Marco Villa was one of those Italians that picked up a bronze medal, two-time World Madison champion as well. The stage tonight starts in his hometown. So uh, the, it's uh, Abitia Grossa or Grasso, Grasso, Abitia Grasso is uh, where Marco Villa is from. So that's my little bit of useless trivia for all of the fans. And we'll finish on Free Ranger says, thanks for the show. All the best to Johnny. Maybe some of Tim Jenkins' vet stories would cheer you up. <laughs> yeah. What a way to finish. Thanks again for tuning in, guys. We'll see you again tomorrow night, and hopefully we're talking about Simon Yates being on the cusp of leading the Giro. We'll finish with Rocky. You look so tired. Why don't you go get some sleep? Oh, no, no. I feel great. I feel great. There's one thing I want you to do for me. What? Come here. What? Win. Win. What are we waiting for? Take this! <laughs>